What is it? Well, good morning, good morning, everyone. We're all kind of coming in the sanctuary here at the same time, if you're just coming in. Uh, please be sure to go back there where Wendy is. Wendy, give a wave. There's Wendy. She has the bulletins. She has some palms. There's communion on the table. We welcome everyone here to worship this morning here in the sanctuary. And those of you who are worshiping with us online, this is Palm Sunday. This is one of the holiest weeks of our Christian year on Palm Sunday is um, uh, the beginning of this Holy Week, which is why we have palms here. We welcome those of you who are online. You won't be able to have palms, uh, but if we have any left over and you'd like some, you could give Janice a call in the office this week. If there are any here, you can come in and pick them up. We also have communion this morning. So if you're sitting at a table, please make sure there are enough cups there for you and some bread. If there isn't, we'll make sure that Wendy back there can help you as well. And we thank the worship committee for getting that already this morning. For those of you, again, worshiping with us online, anything liquid and anything bread-like you can use for communion this morning. You can also find links to our bulletin, also to the announcements on our website and on our Facebook page as well. The words will appear up on the screen, but we also have hymnals around the table today. My brothers and sisters, there's a couple of announcements I'd like to bring to your attention. I would encourage you to read the announcements for yourselves, but also to remind you that there are Easter forms, Easter flower forms available today. They are on the tables. Please be sure to send those in this week so Janice can get that information into our Resurrection Sunday Bulletin. There's also information for our Holy Week services. And uh, just to bring this to your attention, our Monday Thursday service is special this year. We have a Tenebrae service that has been um, uh, joyfully, I would say, expanded through uh, Doug's talent and his insight. And there'll be a lot of music a lot of reading, a lot of participation. This is a wonderful, wonderful service. Please, if you can, make time to attend Monday, Thursday service. For those of you who might not have time to cook dinner or eat a meal at home, there'll be a light supper here at 5.30, and then our Tenebrae service will follow. Good Friday, I'll be here for prayer all through the day. If you can't come in, you can send me a text, you can call me, you can send me an email. I will gladly pray for you and for your prayer requests from 12 to 3 on Good Friday. And then the IMA is also having a Good Friday service that's at Second Baptist, and both Annie Hines and I are participating in that service, and everyone is welcome as well to attend. And of course, next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Lots of times we say Easter Sunday. That's not wrong. It's not bad. I do the same thing. But actually, that word is based on a pagan ritual <laughs> and, and, a, and a pagan goddess, that name, the uh, Estora. And so I tend to kind of focus more on the resurrection than the word Easter. Nothing wrong with it if you do it the other way around. It's, it's really a habit. But it's recognizing the hope of our Christian faith, which is about resurrection. So please be sure to read the rest of the announcements in the bulletin for yourselves to be able to follow along what's happening this week and throughout the month at First Presbyterian Church. My brothers and sisters, remember, Jesus Christ is here. Our resurrected Lord is here in our midst. He, he knocks at the door of our heart. And when we open that door and invite him in, he has promised to come and be with us and to dwell within us. So let us prepare our hearts and our minds as we begin to worship God. Come here we come to the town, everyone is gathered round. Here we come, here we come to the town, Hosanna to the King. Come Jerusalem, adore, holy, holy, holy Lord. Here we come, here we come to the town, Hosanna to the King. 
come, here we come to the town. Lots of love is all around. Here we come, here we come to the town. Hosanna to the king. of worship thank you for this week that gives us the opportunity to walk along beside you to allow your spirit to carry us through the experiences that you had that deepen our intimacy our relationship with you ourselves our God one another we ask for your Holy Spirit to come upon us to anoint this service anoint our minds anoint our hearts our spirits May our words praise you and glorify you. May our prayers be open and honest and authentic before you. And may this time of worship be a time grace-filled, a blessing for you, and a blessing also for all of us. In Christ's name, through him, with him and in him, we praise you, we thank you, we ask these things. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, please stand and join together in our opening song of praise. You can find it in the celebration hymnal. Also, words will be on the screen. Number 300, all glory, laud, and honor. <laughs> Please be seated. Oh, my brothers and sisters, we confess our sins silently in public because it reminds us that we are all in need of forgiveness, of the compassionate mercy of God in Christ Jesus for each of us. And as we accept these beautiful gifts from our God, really our loving God, we in turn are called to so graciously and lovingly extend them as freely to one another. And so I invite you now to join together in our prayer of humility, which you can find printed both on the screen and in the bulletin. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for our life and voice, not only with outward signs such as palm branches, or the occasional Hosanna, but with lives truly turned towards you, it seems such a distance from this present day on Sunday to that day when you enter Jerusalem 
with the shouts of the crowd ringing in your ears. On this side of the resurrection, we confidently believe that we could never have been part of the jeering crowd. Yet, Lord Jesus Christ, when our words and actions reflect a reluctance to confess you publicly as Lord of our lives, we are like the jeering crowd. Forgive us, gracious and loving God. Hear us now as we silently confess our sins to you. Through Christ Jesus we pray. Friends, the truth is that Jesus, through him, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Through his obedience, we are therefore freed from whatever sin enslaves us. Please join together in our baptismal promises. Through the waters of baptism, we have died with Christ and are raised with him. With gratitude and with faith, we will walk the way of Christ. And this is the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Please stand. Our scripture reading this morning will be um, from the Hebrew Bible. We'll be hearing Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. And let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord, and he brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me, and I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me, he is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans, and it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They surround me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my defense, and he has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high, and the Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. 
The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous, and I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we will bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the final procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. Well, this is uh, today the Liturgy of the Palms. That's what today is also as well. Some churches will be reading the Passion. That's the Liturgy of the Passion. But today in our congregation, we will be reading the Liturgy of the Palms. Um, for Monday, Thursday, we will hear the Passion. So if you would like to be part of that again, I encourage you to make time to come and worship on Monday, Thursday. We'll start about 7 o'clock. I should have mentioned that. Dinner's at 5.30. Um, worship is at 7. So as we prepare to hear the word that the Lord has to speak to each of us today in this message we receive from the writer of Matthew's gospel, I would encourage you to take on the mind of a beginner. And a mind of a beginner is a mind open to the awe and the wonder of God and God's truth and God's word. Even if you have heard this reading many, many times in the past, 
Again, I would encourage you to come to it as though you've never heard it before. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you a new way of hearing it, of listening, of accepting, of believing, allowing this new word to transform you today. Join with me as I seek God's blessing upon the hearing and listening and the preaching of this truth. We thank you, loving God. We thank you for this living word that still speaks your truth today. Thank you for the ways that it transforms us. Thank you for the ways it draws us closer to you. Thank you for the ways it feeds the hunger of our souls. It quenches the thirst of what we desire, which is more of you. May we be open to your truth. May you remove every obstacle that distracts us this day. And may we listen and pay attention and believe in and be obedient to that still, calm voice that speaks through every experience of our lives. And we thank you again for the multitude of blessings we receive in coming to your word. In Christ's name we thank you. Amen. So we hear this as they, this is Jesus and the disciples. As they approached Jerusalem and they came to Bethany on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt and the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest and when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, I think for the most part, and I certainly was this way for many years, I found it easier to speak or turn to God when there was a crisis. I think most of us could probably admit that's, that's probably true. And I believe it's true because mostly our guard is down and we're vulnerable and we don't have to make excuses for the way we feel it's a crisis. Enough said. But here's the truth in the matter. If an emergency happens and we have to dial 911, and the only thing we have is a brand new cell phone in a box, which we haven't booted up yet. <laughs> we can't make that call. We need to know how to do it right. We should have that sense before an emergency call even arises that we need to be prepared. But I really believe that many people find their relationship to God to be that 911 call rather than a relationship that we treasure and hold on incessantly like we do our cell phones. Right. And I love my youth because they always have their saying, have your cell phone? No. <laughs> no. Are you allowed to have a cell phone yet? Oh, you are. I'm so proud of you. It's not in church. One of my youth groups said to me once, Pastor Lori, I never text in church. I'm not allowed to do that. I, I thought that's so cool not to text in church. Right? Might text in class, but not in church. Right? 
But it's true. I think, think about the things that we incessantly hold on to. Do we do the same with our relationship to God in Christ? And I think it's because we really don't understand what that relationship is really all about and why it matters that it's nurtured. And like the people in the time of Jesus, they often lived crisis to crisis. There was a food crisis. There was always a shortage of food. They didn't have the same safety nets we have. We know from the stories of healing, people suffered constantly with health crisis. They lived under an oppressive government and an oppressive religious system. So there was always an economic crisis. And we can hear the pain and the poignancy in their voices as they shout out to Jesus as he enters Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. We heard it in Chad's reading, what that means. Literally, it means save us. Save us now. Save us. I wonder if we'll start saying this when we drive. Hosanna, Hosanna. Be so much better than some of the other things I think people yell. Yeah. Hosanna, save me now. No, I'm serious. Think about this, right? Think about it. Just a mindset, right? But in essence, for these folks, in essence, for these folks, when they are crying out, they're crying out from the depths of their souls. And they're crying out in the surface crisis that they're in. It's not a wrong thing to do. It's what basically we all do. And we're told in the scripture to call out to God, right? But if we only stay on the surface, it's just another way of saying, oh, God, save me now. Save me from these debts and save me from this health crisis and give me peace and feed me and, you know, gimme, 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 gimme. And a lot of time, the great crowds that followed Jesus were looking for just that, for relief, not really understanding what else was going to come with that. When in reality, crying out Hosanna really means, please, dear God, release me from this daily crisis that we call hopelessness, hopeless existence, oppression, invisibility, and the list goes on and on. And there are people around the world today, we know this, my brothers and sisters, who can literally cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna today. Save me. Save me from turning on the news and hearing one more time that a child is killed by a gun. Save me from that. I don't know how many kids have to get killed before we say enough is enough. I'm going to say that from the pulpit. I'm not against guns. I'm, I'm against the way that we don't manage how dangerous they are. They're weapons. They're weapons. Words are weapons. <laughs> Money can be used as weapons. Position can be used as weapons. Economics can be used as weapons. These people went through much of the same thing we go through, but they did it without safety nets, without safety nets. And we can't miss the political and religious meaning of this Hosanna of the people, which Jesus and his intentions are very clear. Riding publicly into Jerusalem, he is finally claiming that title of Messiah which for us means also prophet, priest, and king, to his nation, to his people. And yet, Jewish nationalism and victory is what the people around him are celebrating. Waving the palms was no different from us waving our flags on the 4th of July. It's, it's nationalism. It's who we are. Not a bad thing. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just what they're seeing it as. We'll see the same thing in Great Britain when Charles is crowned king. People will be waving the, the Union Jacks. That's what we do. 
But the people of that time didn't understand that just waving those palms didn't mean that their king was coming and they would be freed from everything. What they didn't understand, but Jesus did, was that he rode in triumphantly into Jerusalem as a king not to establish a monarchy and not to be crowned the people's king, but rather to establish everlasting peace between God and humanity. That's the diving deeply that he was doing. But it's hard for people in a crisis, it's hard for any of us in a crisis to see that, to understand it, to experience it. As a priest, he came to restore the ethical integrity of the temple system and to offer himself as the lasting sacrifice for the forgiveness of all sin. Proclaiming as a prophet the embodiment and the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets. And Matthew's gospel tells us what that is. To love the Lord your God with everything that is within you and love your neighbor as yourself. And you cannot love your neighbor if you do not love yourself. And you do not understand that first and foremost, you are loved by God. This entire scene in the entry in Jerusalem begs the question of whether we, like those who stood along the road shouting Hosanna, really care about Jesus and his mission. His message above our own agendas and our own dreams. Do we really want to be saved from the circumstances of a crisis? Or do we want to be saved from the root issues that cause them? Do we want to be saved from the root issues that cause them? Do we want to say, be saved from the root of the evil that is in us, around us? Do we want to be saved by that, from that? Do we want evil overcome in all of its depths? And I think when it starts to hurt our pocketbook, we don't. I'm going to say that too. When it starts to hurt us economically, we don't. We really don't want evil overcome in its depths. Because my brothers and sisters, we are the only ones on this planet. <laughs> the evil is not an outside force. It's in humanity. That's what Jesus Christ came to save us from. That oppression, that turning to that, that saying yes to the garden. You won't really die. Oh, goody, I won't really die. Okay, I'll do this. And this is what Jesus does for humanity when he says yes to the deepest desires of the Father when he goes to the cross. And in doing so, he gives us the strength to say no to the surface desires. Go ahead and, and eat that. You won't die. And yes, I will, because God told me I would. And I can believe that. But you see, it's really hard to say no to those surface desires if we don't have this intimate relationship with God where God is always before us, like the Father always was before Jesus. And the truth is, once we invite Christ Jesus into that kind of intimacy, and I think what really keeps us from that is, we know we're going to have to quit doing stuff. And we know we're going to have to stop thinking stuff and saying stuff that we're comfortable with. And we really don't want to do that. We're just like the disciples, really. But the truth is, once we invite Jesus Christ in that intimately into our life, the truth is, he does more for us, more for us than we could ever imagine, ever, ever imagine. And we should not be surprised that inviting him into a process like this means that our mismatched expectations are rearranged to become God's answer to our deepest problems. And let me repeat that. We should not be surprised than inviting Jesus Christ in an intimate way into anything in our lives 
means that our mismatched expectations are rearranged to become God's answer to our deepest problems. And yet even with these great truths, we often avoid this intimacy with God in Christ Jesus because we know it might hurt a little bit. I'm the same way. But one of the fastest and simplest ways of beginning to deepen a much-needed intimacy is to begin viewing all scripture, all of it, from the Hebrew Bible to Revelation through the ministry of Christ Jesus. He's our ultimate filter. Everything in the Hebrew scripture proclaims the truth of him. He's our ultimate filter. View it through his ministry. And to do that, we have to be willing to allow that intimacy of Christ Jesus to permeate all these little bits and pieces of our lives. And it's a process. You think, well, how do I do this? I'm busy, and I know. Parents, I was thinking of you when I was putting this together because I remember the days when I'd finally get everybody to church. And I'd listen to these sermons, and I'd think, you know, you don't have my life. <laughs> But if we think about it, Jesus was always pressed upon, always pressed upon. And yet he gave us this extraordinary path we can take with all of our responsibilities to find a deeper way to live, not from crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis. And crisis will happen in our life. But rather from truth to truth to truth to truth, here's a crisis Okay, I'm not alone. If I wasn't alone before the crisis, I'm not going to be alone now in the crisis. I'm not going to be alone after the crisis. We forget that sometimes, right? But we have to be willing to practice something that begins to permeate this kind of intimacy in our lives. In your bulletin, and I hope everyone got one of these, is this wonderful card and for those of you who are at home, if you'd like one of these cards, I'm not sure Janice got it up on the um, website. But you could call the office. She's here Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And um, she can get one mailed to you. This comes from Matthew Wilkins. He's the writer of the NIV Matthew application commentary. And I'm going to share with you his practice. I, I found this to be Wonderful, because I'll tell you why. Usually this Holy Week, for the most part, most of us, and I will say this because we're in the office too, it's so busy because we're getting ready for Resurrection Sunday and we're getting ready for big dinners and we're getting ready for little kids that are going to come and we're going to get all this stuff ready and it's all this stuff. And then you have going to work and then you have taking care of your responsibilities and then you have everything else it comes along with that. But it's still Holy Week. And what does that mean? This is the holiest week of our year, and yet it's just kind of like something we, we're so busy we get through, right? It's supposed to mean something. It's supposed to feed us. It's supposed to give us something. So that when we get to Resurrection Sunday... We actually are celebrating in our hearts where we can meet each other at the door and say, he is risen, and we answer in turn, he is risen indeed. So this is what Wilkins writes. I'm going to share this with you. If you want a copy of this, I'll give it to you this week. Just send me a text, give me a call, send me an email. But he writes this that the practice of walking with Jesus through Holy Week, and that's what this is, walking with Jesus through Holy Week, achieves at least five different functions. First of all, it solidifies the historical function and foundation of my Christian worldview. So think about that. He views the world through the ministry of Jesus. And to understand that our faith, our Christian faith, is built on the rock-solid events that Jesus performed in history. Why he was arrested, why the Jewish leaders rejected him, why the Romans executed him, and why even his own followers were so frightened and perplexed. 
so that when we reach Resurrection Sunday, having followed Jesus through this whole week, our faith is not wishful thinking, oh, oh, oh it's so nice today, right? Rather, it's founded on the facts of history revealed in God's word. Secondly, we're helped to understand and ourselves the disciples more clearly. We begin to understand why they were frightened and why they cowered as a group behind closed doors and why they were more concerned with saving their own lives because of the perplexity of seeing their miracle working master led away and crucified. And being crucified was a curse. It was meant to wipe out the person and their entire lineage. It was meant to oppress the people in such an incredible way that the Roman centurions, the Gauls, had it down to such a fine art, if you can imagine this, that no more or less than about 3,000 bodies or body parts were visible in that city. Now think about what that means. Think about being a child and growing up with that. Think about being a, a person on the fringes, seeing that. Think about being a person who has great interest in protecting their place in a society and their wealth, seeing that, how that would form you and fashion you, especially after experiencing Christ Jesus and his work. So when we walk along with Jesus and the, we begin to walk along with the disciples in this holy week, we understand how their experience of seeing him raised from the dead transformed them into courageous and bold leaders who risked everything to tell the world of the good news. And here's the thing, my brothers and sisters, that early church didn't just meet to eat together and give testimony so that they could be a nice, warm, fuzzy group. They did it so that the world could be transformed and we could be here today in 2023 still proclaiming this good news. This is the one I found so important and really hit home. I think you might too. The third thing that happens is we begin to be held under the conviction of our responsibility of a disciple of Christ Jesus. In this second point, he writes, thrusts on him the responsibility as he watches the reaction of the people and the leaders of Israel. They had the greatest privilege to hear Jesus, to speak with him, to watch him, to experience healings and feedings and all the other miraculous things that he did. They had that greatest privilege, and yet, just like us, when we're willing to admit it, our own personal agendas and hard-heartedness rejects Christ Jesus and his message. That's what sin basically is, opposing God from our will and our hearts. And what happens is they get cut off from both their privileges and responsibilities. And we need to remember this as disciples of Christ Jesus. We have to be trusted to live lives and to do ministry according to the criteria of God that Jesus revealed in his earthly ministry. And if we don't do that, we lose those things, and God gives them to the people who will be open to that. It's not something that we can selfishly hold on to or really be prideful about or toot our own horn about. Jesus never did that. And the disciples, once they got it, they didn't either. The other thing that happens when we take this time to walk with Jesus through this Holy Week and his Passion Week, and think about it this way, my brothers and sisters, this was the last week the most beautiful being that ever lived walked this earth. What was he thinking when he ate with his disciples and his friends? 
What was he thinking when he walked around Jerusalem? What was he experiencing when he walked around the temple? I mean, it's a way of going, diving deeply with the Holy Spirit to experience something new you never have before. Why does that matter that you get that? And Wilkins writes this, because when you do this, you experience the events that impels you to be more sincere in your worship and to comprehend the tragedy of what happened in the time of Jesus at the temple. If you're reading along and all in Eugene Peterson's um, New Testament, or excuse me, reading the Bible in a year, it's now in Deuteronomy, and it goes from Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, but it's all about the worship and how God set this all up for this company of people so that they could always have God in the forefront. They could smell God from the sacrifices. They could see God in the fire and in the cloud. They could hear the voice of God through Moses. Everything about their life in that desert was supposed to bring them to the attention that God is in their midst. We too are called to do the same thing. That's what worship can do for us. And one of the greatest failures, really, of that time of Jesus is that they didn't understand that fundamental significance of worship and the temple. It was to be the center of their life, not to oppress people and to keep them chained to things that made them feel less than beloved. It's supposed to free us. Remember? The life, the truth, the way... (laughs) I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. I came that you may have joy and have it abundantly, even in the life you're living right now, which might be wonderful and have a crisis or two. But no, I am with you. And we want to make sure, especially in our worship, especially in our devotion to God, personally, privately, and in community, that what we do is not simply religious ritual and self-serving hypocrisy. When we think about that, how much do we do in the everyday routines of our life that's lived in the conscious, conscious presence of God in Christ Jesus? It's easy to do in worship, I think. Although if it's a boring sermon, you might want to veg out. I've certainly done that from time to time. But the reality is, as I say every week, Jesus Christ is here in this time and place. How do we see him? Within our mind. And we experience him in our spirit and in community. And we praise him for the week that we have had. And we bring our heartache before him in community to understand, fifthly, that we are drawn into a more intimate relationship with Jesus, having walked with him through all the events of Holy Week, all the events of any week, when we understand we've entered into a fellowship that he also experienced, that he experienced with his closest followers, with the adrenaline rush of the entry into Jerusalem and the clearing of the temple and the tenderness of the final moments of the Silent Wednesday in the upper room, supper, and the heartbreak of seeing his disciples turn away from him in his hour of greatest need, and even to deny him. Wilkins writes this, I have followed Jesus into the garden where in utter anguish he prays for a different path, but then resolutely accept the Father's will of going to the cross. I have drawn as close as I dare to witness his physical pain of scourging and crucifixion and have tried as feebly as I can to comprehend the abandonment he experiences from the Father. And as Paul says, experienced being raised with him from the dead as I reconsider and reclaim my own salvation experience. And more than anything, my brothers and sisters, even if you are able to do this sporadically, 
try to keep this at the forefront of your life this week. Put it somewhere where you can see it, your family can see it, maybe you can practice it as a family. I would encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to guide you in that practice and how you might do it, what works for you. Maybe you'll have time to take time to read the scripture. Maybe you can just reference the scripture, whatever it is. But continually ask the Holy Spirit to draw you into this week a little more deeply because I'll tell you what will happen. You will find by Resurrection Sunday, even if you do this a little bit, that you will begin to revere God. And I'll tell you what we're losing in our culture and in our churches, I believe this. We are not revering God. And the early Christians did this. And they emerged from their worship, not for the sake of keeping the religious organization in line. They did it so they didn't leave the world as they found it as they were transformed in revering God, as they allowed God's Holy Spirit to transform them, they went out into the world to preach a living, resurrected Jesus, making followers of the truth. And today, my brothers and sisters, that's what this waving of palms should claim for us, for our own lives, for our own congregations in allegiance to God's vision for the world. Not ours, but God's. May your holy week be a time of enormous blessing, peace, and grace for all of you. And know, too, that I will be praying for you and with you. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, as we ponder the ways in which the Lord may have spoken to each of our lives today, I would encourage you to stand and join together in our hymn of grace, Hosanna Loud, Hosanna. <laughs> While you're still standing, please join together in our affirmation of faith. You can find printed in the bulletin and on the screen. Jesus Christ is born in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, 
and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Amen. Please be seated. Just to be sure, does everyone have communion in front of them today? You should have a cup, and you should have a little bag with the bread. Anyone need anything? Feel free to go ahead and take the lid off your cup and to take your bread out of the bag as we begin our sacrament of communion. My brothers and sisters, please join together in the great prayer of thanksgiving, which you can find printed in the bulletin and on the screen. The Lord be with you. Absolutely. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right in our greatest joy to give you all thanks and all praise. Loving God, thank you. Christ Jesus, that you instituted this meal for us. Thank you for the blessing that it is for us still today. Thank you for this bread that reminds us of the cost of grace. Your body broken. Thank you for the cup that reminds us of the price of forgiveness. Remind us in these moments of grace how valuable we are to you. And in being valuable to you, we can value ourselves and value one another. All those whom we love, those whom we may struggle with and disagree with, even those who from our heart we may hate and not understand. Continue to transform us. Call us all who are with you this day into a holy week where we walk with you. We speak to you, our deep fears, our concerns, not only about what happened to you that week, but what happens to us in the moments of our lives and especially this week to come. May we recognize that slowing down is much better than moving so quickly and pushing so much into our lives that we don't have a moment for you or for ourselves or for anyone else. May we grasp hold of the moments of grace that awaits us within this time of communion with you and one another and ask your great blessing upon it all. In Christ Jesus, amen. Luke's gospel tells us that when Jesus was at the table with his disciples, that he gave thanks to Yahweh that caused the grain to spring from the earth. And looking at his disciples, he said to them, this is my body, which is given and broken for you. Take and eat. And after the meal, Jesus also took the cup. Again, he took the wine. He gave thanks to Yahweh that causes the grape to spring from the earth. Pouring out that wine, he said to his disciples, as he says to us, this is my blood that is shed for you and for the forgiveness of all sin. And this is the new covenant new promise that when you take this bread and you drink this cup you do this in memory of me my brothers and sisters take the bread the bread of heaven and eat drink from the cup the cup of salvation the forgiveness for all sin.
Please join with me in prayer. Loving and holy God, we thank you for these moments of worship. We thank you for the ways that you continue to speak to each heart and each mind, drawing us all closer to you, to ourselves, to one another. We ask your continued blessing upon all those who are here in worship this day and those souls who are not with us. Be with them as well. And as we lift everything to you this morning, as we dedicate not only this service, but the entire week, ourselves, our wills to you, we trust the fact that you take everything into yourself and through the power of your Holy Spirit, we might rest assured that in the end, that all shall be made well. All shall be made well. All manner of life within Christ Jesus shall surely be made well. And we believe you hear us now in the prayer that Christ Jesus has given to us. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be be thy name. name. Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy will be done done on earth earth as it is is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My brothers and sisters, please stand and join together in our closing song of hope. Crown him with many crowns. 45. good news within you. You are called to take this out into the world, and as Jesus said, never be afraid. For it is Jesus Christ who strides out before you, 
He goes ahead of you. He prepares a place for you. He waits there for you. And when you lose your way, I guarantee you, he will turn back on that road to meet you. And I bless you now in the power of our loving God, our Abba Father, who does love you more than you could ever imagine, who sent Jesus Christ into this world to reveal the life, the truth, the love, the way. And the Holy Spirit that binds you to God and to one another. Amen and amen. Have a blessed holy week.